Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the second set of three months for the year 2014. That would be April, May, and June. This series of lessons is entitled Christ and His Law, and this one, lesson number seven from May 17 of 2014, is entitled Christ, the End of the Law. Now that doesn't sound like it ought to go along with continuing to obey the law, does it? What do we mean when we say the end of the law? The goal? Well, hang on, let's see what it says. You don't give us the answer at the beginning, that's not fair. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's begin. I hope you have your Bible handies. We'll be looking at a lot of Bible verses. Um, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, what a privilege it is to come to your word and seek to understand it. We wish that we could each be closer to you, to be more like Jesus so that others might even see some of him in us. Now help us to understand this lesson and what's implied by the words of Paul is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the purpose of this lesson really is to learn what the relationship is between the plan of salvation and the law of God. Plan of salvation, law of God. Now here's an illustration for, taken right from our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide from May 10 of 2014. Sabbath afternoon, the reading says, a well-known magazine ran a full-page ad with a headline that read, Achieve Immortality. We're not kidding. In a sense, they were kidding because the ad went on to say, to find out how you can leave a charitable legacy <laughs> that will <laughs> make gifts in your name forever, contact us for our free booklet. Okay, so how do you live forever? Give them money. Endowment. Yeah, charitable leave an endowment. Some sort. <laughs> If we are saved only by faith in Jesus Christ, and where do we read that? Acts, Acts 16, 16 what did Paul and Silas say to the jailer? They said, they answered, believe, that's the word for faith, have faith in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your family. How many requirements are there for salvation? Two. Only one, one believe. 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 Okay, now that's not just to say, Oh, I believe, that's it, fine, done, now I can go on with my business. No. Faith is a relationship with God, is with a friend. As we noted last week, breaking one of the commands of God leads to death. No amount of careful law-keeping can atone for or rectify the fact that we are sinners. This is not, there are some religions, and I won't mention any of them by name, that give you the idea that Okay, your good deeds are on one side of the scale and your bad deeds are on the other side of the scale and if you have enough good deeds, then you're going to be saved. No, it doesn't work like that. However, as human beings, we need laws to guide us in our daily activities. The law has several important functions that we need to discuss. What is the relationship between law and grace? Well, an excellent example of that is found in Romans 5. We're going to read verses 12 to 21. Romans 5, 12 to 21. See what your translation reads along my, alongside my Good News Bible. Sin came into the world through one man. Who was that? Adam. Adam. It should have said one woman, right? No, one man, Adam. And his sin brought death with it. As a result, death has spread to the whole human race because everyone has sinned. Okay, so we share in Adam's fate because of what Adam did, or we share in God, Adam's fate because of we, what we do? We do. Because of what we do. There was sin in the world before the law was given. He's talking about being given on Mount Sinai now. But where there is no law, no account is kept of sins. Now, that bothers a lot of people. Um, we've, we've, I've suggested to you that and, and we'll look at this a little bit later. We'll see some quotations suggesting that law was there not in written form, but in oral form before. But from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, death ruled, meaning there was law, right? 
over the whole human race, even over those who did not sin in the same way that Adam did when he disobeyed God's command. Adam was the figure of the one who was to come, but the two are not the same because God's free gift is not like Adam's sin. It is true that many people died because of the sin of that one man, but God's grace is much greater and so is his free gift to so many people through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. And there is a difference between God's gift and the sin of one man. After the one sin came the judgment of guilty. But after so many sins comes the undeserved gift of not guilty. It is true that through the sin of one man, death began to rule because of that one man. But how much greater is the result of what was done by the one man, Jesus Christ? All who receive God's abundant grace and are freely put right with him will rule in life through Christ. So then, as the one sin condemns all people, condemned, I'm sorry, past tense, all people, in the same way the one, and how did one sin condemn all people? Mm -hmm. what, do, what do we mean by that? I mean, does Adam's sin make me guilty? It sounds like that. It's like, like an imputed sin. Sounds like it. So what, in what sense could that be true? Well, Adam's sin separated us from God. Separated the what? human race from God, actually. Mm -hmm. Because uh, he's the father of the human race. Okay. Physically, how did that happen? They were thrown out of the garden. That's not too complicated, is it? How many of us have had the opportunity to live in the Garden of Eden? None of us. How many of us have had access to the Tree of Life? None of us. So by separating us from God, by moving the human race out of the Garden of Eden, away from the Tree of Life, He has done what? He's condemned all people in the same way the One Righteous Act sets all people free and gives them life. So in the same way, the death of the life and death of Jesus Christ now says, okay, you can have a choice. Live the kind of life which Jesus lived, and you'll live, and you'll live forever. Or you will die, live, the, you, live your selfish kind of life, your selfish choices, and you will die the death which he died. And now, just, yeah. now, since um, Adam was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. is he going to be saved? Yes. Well, how could he when he was kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Well, it, uh, have you ever sinned? Have I ever sinned? Yeah. Sure. Then how could you possibly be saved? Well, you said that he was, he was not saved because he was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. No, I said that he was separated from God and that none of us have... Because he, he was kicked out of the, the Garden of Eden. He was never, none of us, either him nor Eve, nor any of us from that time have been able to go back into the Garden of Eden to eat of the Tree of Life. And so goes my question. Was he saved now? Is, oh, he, is Adam saved? He has the same basis for being saved, and he will be saved. He had the same opportunity to be saved that you and I have. But he not, was a sinner? Going, it's not by going back to the Garden, though. right? No, 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 no. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And just as a mass of people were made sinners as a result of the disobedience of the one man, that is, we're out of the garden, in the same way the mass of people will all be put right with God as a result of the obedience of one man. Law was introduced in order to increase wrongdoing, but where sin increased, God's grace increased much more. So then, just as sin ruled by means of death, where does sin get its power? 1 Corinthians 15 from the law. So just as sin ruled by means of death, so also God's grace rules by means of righteousness, leading us to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So basically, the law let us know that we are sinners. Mm -hmm. However, if we don't accept that fact, then we don't get the grace that mm -hmm. comes with it. Okay. But if we're not willing to admit that we're sinners, God, there's not much God can do for us. These verses present a very simple and straightforward discussion of the problem of sin and the plan of salvation. Through Adam and Eve, sin entered the human race. According to Genesis 2, 16 and 17, they should have died right then, right? Not what it says? Sure. According to Genesis, I'm sorry, but instead allowed, allowing them to die on the spot, 
Instead of allowing them to die on the spot, God gave them a temporary extension of life so they might have opportunity to learn the truth and return to their loyalty to God. Satan had claimed that once Adam and Eve sinned, the entire human race belonged to him. He claimed to be the king of this world. He claimed that no human being could live a sinless life on this earth and thus be saved. But when Jesus came, he proved that Satan was wrong. He proved that sin does lead to death and that Satan had been lying about God's original statement in Genesis 2. And you remember his statement in Genesis 3, 1 to 5. So, what was the result? When the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, having been slaves for many years, God thought it was appropriate to give them a number of laws, including the Ten Commandments. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to Egypt. I've had the privilege of visiting Egypt a couple of times. And you learn that the ancient things, what was really important in those ancient times, was written down how? Clay. In stone. Yes. Written down in stone. If it was really important, it was written down in stone. So when God wanted to say something really important to the children of Israel, how was it written down? In stone. As a result of this more detailed giving of the law, sin seemed to abound. Because now, oh yeah, you did that? Look what it says over here. You did that? Look what it says. You did back and forth. It might have seemed that the human race was hopeless because we were drowning in sin. Ellen White has some very interesting statements about the giving of the law and even why it was given. So here's, here's the point we want to listen to this very carefully. This is talking about back before the law was given. If Adam had not transgressed the law of God, specifically disobeying what God had told him to do, the ceremonial law would never have been instituted. The gospel of good news was first given to Adam in the declaration made to him that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head. And it was handed down through successive generations to Noah, Abraham, and Moses. Where did it come from? God. It was given to Adam. By God, right? And it's still being handed down as far as Moses. The knowledge of God's law and the plan of salvation were imparted to Adam and Eve by Christ himself. They carefully treasured the important lesson and transmitted it by word of mouth to their children and children's children. Thus the knowledge of God's law was preserved. Signs of the Times, March 14, 1887, 1878. And that's, that's quoted or copied in Select Messages, Book 1, page 230. Well, now here in Patriarchs and Prophets, she spells that out in a little more detail. If man had kept the law of God, as given to Adam after his fall, preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham. What did it say in Genesis 26, verse 5? Abraham kept my commandments, my laws, etc., right? There would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. What did that do, honestly? The, the ordinance of circumcision basically was supposed to identify the Jews so that they would not become involved in the fertility cult religious practices that were going on in the nations around them. You, get, you went to those, one of those religious orgies with all your clothes off, etc., people would know immediately, you're a Jew. Okay? And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant of which circumcision was a sign, they would never have been seduced into idolatry, nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. Wow. They would have kept God's law in mind, and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved upon the tables of stone. What law is that? <laughs> Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. What would have happened? If they had kept God's law in mind, where is it supposed to be? Why? in the mind. If they had kept it in mind, it wouldn't have been necessary for God to write on tables of stone. And had the people practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need of the additional directions given to Moses. Patriarchs and Prophets, 364, paragraph 2. What does that tell us? 
Law has been around since the moment of sin, or almost. Following the giving of the law, it was natural for human beings to get the general impression that just keeping that law would result in salvation. Many of the prophets rejected that idea in various ways. Isaiah, one of the major prophets, said, we've, we've quoted this many times, Isaiah 59, verse 2, It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. I don't know how you could say it any clearer than that. What would you say to someone who say, like all those contingency, if, then, why do, did all that happen when God has foreknowledge of everything? Why didn't it just not allow it to happen? Well, because, choice. yeah, he, if, he, if he takes away our choice, he turns us into robots. Yeah. And he's love, so yeah. we have to have choice. Yeah. Intelligent creatures have to be able to make a choice. So if disobedience and sin separate us from God, what should be the answer to that problem? Disobedience and sin separate us from God. What should be the answer to that problem? Obedience. Shouldn't it be coming back to God? I mean, if the problem is that we're separated from God, how do we solve that problem? We need to come back to God, right? Mm -hmm. Romans 14, 23. We looked at this last week. But if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it because their action is not based on faith and anything that is not based on faith is all right. Huh? No, it's sin, right? Sin leads us away from God. Faith brings us back to God. So the solution to the sin problem is coming back to God. What's the word for coming back to God? Repentance. Well, repentance is the word for turning around. What's the actual word for that, that what brings us back to God? It's faith. That's the relationship. So now we've talked about faith. When you don't have faith, you have sin. Mm -hmm. When you don't have the law, you don't have sin. So, which is the more important to us? Well, the difference is this. You, there, sin was there. We just read the passage from even when law wasn't even when law wasn't clearly spelled out as it was later. But, so God was a little more tolerant of people in the days when there wasn't law spelled out. So law is spelled out, that points out sin, so law, sin abounds, Romans 5, at when, or sin abounded when the law was spelled out. Faith doesn't just leave it like that. The law can't do anything about the fact that we're disobeying. It just points it out, says, you're doing bad things. Bang, it's done. The law can't do anything more. Faith says, the way to give up those bad things is to come back to God. And that, that relationship, that coming back to God, is described, is, the word is faith. So as a result, we have a choice. We can either, one, continue to live our sinful, selfish lives, doing whatever we feel like doing. Well, look at our world around us. And we will die the second death that Jesus died at the end of his human life. Or, two, Look at his life, come to admire him, and through a careful study of that life, through the scriptures and communication with him, through prayer, and sharing what we have learned with others, we can develop a lasting faith relationship with him that will bring salvation. Are there any questions about those two choices? Hmm. I don't know how to say it any clearer than that. Does the devil play a part in people not responding right? Yes. Yeah. And, and how does he play his part? He tries to make the things of this world as attractive as possible. He tries to deceive us. He tries to mislead us. He tries to distract us. Yeah. He does everything he can to lead us in the wrong direction. So if in our pursuit of understanding God assuming we want to have faith and to get to know God, and becoming more and more like Jesus, these processes are actually working, and God is working in our lives to change our ways of thinking and acting. How could that possibly be an excuse to go on sinning? That wouldn't make any sense, would it? Yeah. Well, look at Romans 6, 15 to 23. 
What then shall we say? Because we are not under the law, but under God's grace? By no means. Surely you know that when you surrender yourselves as slaves to obey someone, you are in fact the slaves of the master you obey, either of sin, which results in death, or of obedience, which results in being put right with God. But thanks be to God, for though at one time you were slaves to sin, you have obeyed with all your heart the truths found in the teaching you received. You were set free from sin and became the slaves of righteousness. And Paul says, I'm using everyday language because of the weakness of your natural selves. At one time you surrendered yourselves entirely as slaves to impurity and wickedness for wicked purposes. In the same way, excuse me, in the same way you must now surrender yourselves entirely as slaves of righteousness for holy purposes. When you were the slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. What do you gain from doing the things that you are now ashamed of? The result of those things is death. But now you have been set free from sin and are the slaves of God. Your, your gain is a life fully dedicated to Him, and the result is eternal life. How do you know when you've made the choice? It's probably not going to be a just black and white bang. Oh, five seconds ago I didn't, and five, now I have. The conversion process is what Satan doesn't want to happen. It's the how last you know, thing in the world that he wants to happen. How do you know that the conversion process is happening? Well, if you, as you become more and more acquainted with God and you find you're happier and happier doing His will as opposed to doing your will, then you know that you're moving in the right direction. If you're getting happier and happier, well, that's going to be your, that's going to be your um, As you become test, more and more comfortable with God's way of doing things. You're going to be happier and happier. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, let's see. For sin pays its wage, death. But God's free gift is eternal life and union with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Sin pays its wage. What's its wage? Death. Yes. So what is the ongoing relationship between law and grace? Well, we're asking big complicated questions, mm -hmm. aren't we? It is God's plan that we should be set free from sin by obedience to the law. Unfortunately, we learn by hard experience that we cannot keep the law through our own power. The only successful way to keep the law is to study the life of Christ and seek to follow His example. As we think about Him and come to appreciate all He has accomplished, we find ourselves coming to love Him more each day. We want to be like Him. So, by beholding, we become changed. Great Controversy, page 555. So keeping the law, is that accepting Christ or is that doing things a certain way? Okay, here's, here's the issue. You can't keep the law on your own power. You can try real hard. The Pharisees tried real hard. You can't do it. See? So what you have to... I mean, it's, it might seem like a, a strange way to say things, but the way you keep the law is by turning away from, from the law and looking at Jesus. If you keep focusing on the law, you're going to go on failing. But then, how if, do you if, know let, if you made the right a, decision if you're not doing what the law says after that? Let, let me give you a funny illustration that might illustrate this. Suppose you have a five-year-old, let's say a four-year-old or a three-year-old son. And he looks up to you and he says, I want to be as tall as Dad. I want to be big and strong like Dad. So you get out your rack that the ancient people used to use to torture people and say, okay, we'll hook your head onto one end of it and we'll hook your feet on the other end and we'll crank you out here until you get to be the right length. Is that going to work? Not going to work. Well, unless you're stretchy, but you're not <laughs> stretchy. Constructively. Not going to work. Not going to work at all. You're going to kill him before you stretch him out. So how do we get him to be as tall as you? We keep stuffing stuff in his mouth. That doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, you know, we know why it works, but I mean, it, superficially you say, how can you make him longer by stuffing stuff in his mouth here? So it's, it's that way with the law. You, you, you want to be 10 feet tall. 
and you're never going to make it on your own. You can't stretch out. You can't. It's just not going to happen. The only way you can do it is by keep feeding spiritual truth into your lives through living and observing and wanting to be more like Jesus. Wouldn't it work, though, to tell the young boy that have faith, you will grow? Well, he, he's not going to understand what you're saying if you say that to him. You, what you do is you say, eat your food. <laughs> yeah, but how would he understand over that over having faith? You try it sometime. Try to take a five-year-old and say, have faith. And he'll say, huh? If you say, eat your food, is he going to understand? Sure, he's going to understand. Yeah, you better eat the food or else you can't leave the table. <laughs> exactly. But, but um, when it starts coming down to wanting to be as tall as dad, uh, isn't it good advice to say, have faith, you will grow as tall as your dad. Yeah, you can say that, but the more important thing to say is eat your food. Eat your food, okay. Our salvation comes from our new relationship with Jesus Christ, a relationship called faith. But as we become more and more like him, it will certainly not set us free, in quotation marks, to break his law. And I read from Ellen White here again. This is from Acts of the Apostles. 393, paragraph 1. Paul had ever exalted the divine law. He had shown that in the law there is no power to save men from the penalty of disobedience. Wrongdoers must repent of their sins and humble themselves before God, whose just wrath they have incurred by breaking his law. When we say his just wrath they have incurred by breaking his law, what are we saying? Separation. They're separating themselves from God by breaking his law. And they must also exercise faith in the blood of Christ as their only means of pardon. You must observe and you must come to understand what the death of Christ means, what it's trying to teach us in order to gain that pardon. The Son of God had died as their sacrifice and had ascended to heaven to stand before the Father as their advocate. By repentance and faith, they might be freed from the condemnation of sin and through the grace of Christ be enabled how henceforth to render obedience to the law of God. Acts of the Apostles 393, paragraph 1. Let us say, and I would like to say unequivocally, that we are not saved by keeping the law. I think Jesus said that enough times to the Pharisees that it's safe for me to say it. There are two reasons for this. Why, why, what are the two reasons why we can't be saved by keeping the law? We can't do it. Number one, simply, we, we can't keep it perfectly. We never will. And two, law keeping was never intended to be and cannot be a way of salvation. We go back to one, because you can't do it, right? More than that, in our natural human selfishness, we enjoy sinning. Now, I know nobody at this table enjoys sinning, but... You know, it's sort of a human characteristic, right? Maybe, and this is, this is what I, the verse, I, the way I like to read Romans 10 for. Maybe I should read it in my Good News Bible first, but perhaps the best understanding of Romans 10 for was given, and that's where the title for our lesson comes from, was given by J.B. Phillips in his paraphrase of the New Testament, but I'm going to take you to my Good News Bible first. And it, this is pretty good. For Christ has brought the law to an end so that everyone who believes is put right with God. Now, you might think from that, okay, we don't need the law anymore. R Phillips put it this way, and he's, he's speaking specifically to the Pharisees, and that's what Paul was speaking to. Christ means the end of the struggle for righteousness by the law for everyone who believes in him. What's he talking about? He's... Go ahead. Well, there's a sort of peace that comes with knowing that the work is done. Basically, we just have to respond and do our part. Mm -hmm. But the main work is done. That's how I okay. like to look at it. Now, Paul was a, had been a Pharisee. In fact, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he was still struggling with sin and law keeping, wasn't he? Yeah. Romans 7. So what is he trying to say here in Roman 10, Romans 10, 4? He was saying, I used to think, remember the rich young ruler that Jesus talked to? What did he say about his law keeping? 
All these things I have done from my youth up, right? All these things. Did he believe? If you'd stopped him right after, or just before he talked to Jesus, and you'd say, you know about the Ten Commandments? Yeah. Have you kept them? Absolutely. He would have told you. And Paul, before he became a Christian, what would he have told you? Have you kept the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. They, they had all their ways in and out and around and so forth, and they believed that they had figured out how to keep the Ten Commandments. Okay? So now what is Paul saying in Romans 10, 4? Christ means the end of the struggle for righteousness by the law, being a Pharisee and thinking it's going to save you, for everyone who believes in him. So now, in contrast to trying to win your salvation by keeping the law, how do you do it? Faith in God. What is belief in him? Faith in God, yeah. Well, look at Romans 7, 21 to 25. This is a real illustration of what we're talking about. So I find that this law is at work. When I want to do what is good, what is evil is the only choice I have. My inner being delights in the law of God, I know it's the right thing, but I see a different law at work in my body, a law that fights against the law which my mind approves of. So it sounds like, you know, we got this part of our body says follow God, and this part of our body says no, right? It makes me a prisoner to the law of sin which is at work in my body. What an unhappy man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is taking me to death? And what is his next response? Thanks be to God who does this through our Lord Jesus Christ. So how do I, how do I stop sinning? This is really important. How do I stop sinning? It's not by trying harder to keep the, keep the law. I stop sinning by looking at the life of Jesus and saying, I like that. I want to be more like it. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not asking here to just sort of magically get rid of my sins. I just want to be more like Jesus. And every day I want to be more like Jesus. And every day I want to be more like Jesus. And eventually it will happen. What does it mean to be more like Jesus? How detailed did you want that answer? <laughs> no, well, we say it, but uh, what does it mean? You know, what, what are the steps? Put away your self-centeredness. Yeah. That's too Live broad. A life. Live a life of love. Takes time. Okay. Yeah, live a life of, <clears throat> of love. So, thanks be to the Lord who gives us through our Lord Jesus Christ. This then is my condition. On my own, I can serve God's law only with my mind, while my human nature serves the law of sin. Okay, I got a question right here. Okay. We just said that, that gra the Lord is going to write His law into our heart. Which yeah, my 31. Is, which you said is in our mind. Mm -hmm. He just said that he was keeping the law in his mind, but yet he was still sinning on the outside. Yeah. So how, how is that working then? Well, what he's, what he's saying is that he, he had developed a lot of bad habits in his earlier days. Times when he thought he was keeping the law, in fact, he wasn't. He was still a rebel. His mind, if you had asked him any questions about how to keep the law, and, and even as a Christian, he could have explained all this. He's writing it down here. So you're, you're talking about something that was before? That, that he's talking in this verse? Well, that's the next that question. Was, was that's before? the next question I want to ask you. At what time in the process of a Christian's life is he talking about? That's the theological question that's been around for a two, couple thousand years. I'd say all three. Is this before conversion, during conversion, or after conversion? And my question is, the way I would ask that is, okay, which part in the life of, what time in the life of Christian, of the life, in the life of the Christian, is Satan not active? Never. Never. Exactly. Never. He doesn't abandon you. Satan is there. If, he's, if he sees us, any one of us, turning away from him and trying to move closer to Christ, he gets alarmed. What, he knows that if enough people do that, what's going to happen to him? Right? It's going to be all over for him. But many of us have developed enough bad habits. To, he doesn't yeah. have to work very hard. So is hard. that what he's talking about? Is he talking about the <clears throat> devil here? Yeah. Is he talking about the devil? Well, he's talking about sin and sin. He's talking about sin. Okay, but, but back to my question. 
um, the law being written in our heart, which is our mind. Yeah. He says on there that he, he in his mind, he does not want to sin, but the outward body does all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So how does writing anything in your heart going to make any difference? Okay, let me ask the question to you. Do you ever struggle between doing right and what, doing what's wrong? No, you're talking about... No, come you're on. Ta no, you're talking about what happens to us when we are finally converted, ready to go to heaven. Yeah. Okay, it changes in our mind. Right. But he says that it's in his mind now. Yeah. But, but he's still got all these problems. Would, would, you okay, so would you say that at the point in his life when Paul is writing the book of Romans that he's a saint? <laughs> no, he's not a saint. But you were, we were talking about... Your Roman Catholic friends are certainly saying the, he was a saint. You're talking about the promise of the law being written in his heart. Okay. Written in our heart. Okay? So here's... So we're, we're getting the, the um, law written in our heart. Mm -hmm. But when it gets written in our heart, what difference is it between getting written in our heart then... To Paul right then, which still has the trouble with the outward body. Okay, and the answer should be obvious in your life, to you, and my life, to me. The better we get to know God, the easier it is to do His, His ways. We know that naturally we do it Satan's ways. That's a perfectly, na I mean, absolutely known in every one of our lives. I mean, I don't care how much of a saint you are. I don't even have to know your name. I know that you've struggled with this problem. So what Paul is saying here is, you may have studied the Bible enough, you may have come to know Christianity enough, so you know what you should do. But your body, your, your customs, your habits, are still leading you to do bad things. And the process of salvation is the one by one leaving behind those bad customs, those bad habits, and moving more and more toward doing the good things, the, bad, the good habits, practicing, practicing living a life like Jesus Christ. So you will drive all those things out of your body eventually? eventually. When, the, when you arrive at heaven, they'll be gone. Well, that's because you'll have a new body. Well, I say, yeah, that, you don't, you don't, the character was what matters. The character you have right now will not, well, at the at point when you die or when you're translated, that character is taken with you to heaven. It's not changed. It's not, you don't get a, a, a new Gary, when you get when you arrive in well, heaven, not, you take your character heaven. It's not it's not a question of a human body. It's not the human body that's the problem. Well, he's talking about the body and his members going um, against. Yeah, I have a question. Should we transpose? Should we change what he says the heart to the mind? And when Paul say his mind, is he talking about his heart? He has a feeling. He has a um, What's the word I'm using? He wants to do right, but you know, like uh, there's another place in the Bible where say if your hand make you yeah. cut it off and whatever you. And so is that what he's kind of talking about here? Like he wants to do what's right yeah. from his heart. I think in the Bible, I don't think they fully understood the function of the no. heart and the no, function no. of the brain. No. So that may be. The propensity for sin is there, but hopefully mm -hmm. it's less and less yes. as you progress along. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And the, the more, the closer you get to God, the more visible sin is. You know when you're wrong. You know yeah. you're wrong. So that makes it. Satan will do whatever he can to prevent us from coming back to Christ in a faith relationship. This is, this is life or death stuff with him. He will suggest all kinds of subtle temptations as Jesus spelled out in Matthew 5. But God has provided a way around all of those problems. A continual focus on the life and death of Jesus with the daily desire to understand it more fully will turn our attention away from the tempter to the man of salvation, of our salvation. The King James Version, Romans 10, 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Many have taken this verse along with Romans 6, 14. Let's look at that for a second. Romans 6, 14 says, and let me just take the King James, since uh, that's what we're talking about here. Um, give me a second. I'll get to the King James here. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. 
So if Christ is the end of the law, we're not under the law but under grace, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Sounds like the law is not, not functioning in our lives anymore, doesn't it? Many have taken this, these two verses together to mean that we do not need the law anymore. Christ has made it obsolete. Of course, that goes against many other passages in the writings of Paul. For example, Romans 3.31, which says, Does this mean that by this faith we do away with the law? No, not at all. That's the strongest way of saying no you can, you can have in the Greek language. Instead, we uphold the law. We must admit that the Pharisees and the other Jews certainly worked hard at keeping the law. But Romans 2 tells us that their attempts at salvation by keeping the law were a monumental failure. Their human efforts at keeping the law could never bring salvation. But it is always easier to take a very literal reading of the Ten Commandments and try to suggest that we have not broken any one of them on a given day instead of accepting the true plan of salvation, which is to study the life of Christ and try to be more like Him every day. Christ will become our salvation if we allow Him, through the work of the Holy Spirit, to transform our lives each day. So now we come to a related passage from Paul written about the same time in the book of Galatians. How do you understand Galatians 3, 19-24? What then was the purpose of the law? It was added in order to show what wrongdoing is. And it was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendant to whom the promise was made. So is this the Ten Commandments? I think the word, word uh, that is, comes as added could just as well be stated. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was already there. The law was there. It just uh, it was, it was enunciated. It was written down, made uh, visible. But it was, the law is always that way. Okay. Is that what it means? Well, let's, let's read on. Let's read the whole passage. It was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendant, singular. Who's it talking about? Mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus. To whom the promise was made. What promise is it talking about? Genesis 3.15, remember? The law was handed down by angels with a man acting as a go-between. Who was the go-between? On the Mount, Mount of Sinai? Moses. But a go-between is not needed when only one person is involved and God is one. Does this mean then that the law is against God's promises? No, not at all. For if human beings had received a law that could bring life, remember them three times there, if you want to look it up, Exodus 19.8, Exodus 24, 3 and 7, all that the Lord has said we will do, right? But if the, what? They met it when they well, said sure. it. Of course. They like the people, you know, the four when you throw the seed, one thing grow and choke it. And they were like one of those, I don't remember exactly. Yeah. It might yeah. have been kind of like an altar call. Yeah. They, they just, they're funny. It, 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 well, some people you got like up, those. so everybody else gets up, and, and, uh, but their, their mind is really not there. If human beings had received a law that could bring life, then everyone could be put right with God by obeying it. But the scripture says that the whole world is under the power of sin. And so the gift which is promised on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ is given to those who believe. They trust in God. But before the time for faith came, the law kept us all locked up as prisoners until this coming faith should be revealed. I mean, if all you have is the law, you struggle with it. And you don't get very far. But when the life of Christ comes along, you say, oh, I don't, I don't win this game by trying to keep the law. I win this game by becoming like Jesus Christ. So the law was in charge of us until Christ came in order that we might then be put right with God through faith. Now that the time for faith is here, the law is no longer in charge of us. Okay. What does that mean? Well, the word in Greek which is translated in charge of us is a Greek word paidagogos. What do we know about a paidagogos? 
It refers to a trusted slave who was put in charge of the son of a wealthy Greek or Roman family. It was this mentor disciplinarian who was to make sure that the son learned how he was supposed to live his life. Make sure he went to school, make sure he studied his lessons, while at the same time protecting him from kidnappers, etc. The Greek of Galatians 2.24 can be translated until Christ came or to bring us to Christ. The law is supposed to do both. In our times of ignorance, the law points a finger at the kind of behavior which is acceptable to God and which preserves our lives. In other words, if we don't kill each other, we live longer, right? Yes. Thus, the law serves as a kind of disciplinarian, but also a protection for those who take it seriously. So here's a very interesting passage from Ellen White. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. In this scripture, the Holy Spirit, through the apostle, is speaking especially of the moral law. Which law is the moral law? What we call the Ten Commandments. What we call the Ten Commandments. The law reveals sin to us and causes us to feel our need of Christ and to flee unto Him for pardon and peace by exercising repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The law of Ten Commandments is not to be looked upon as much from the prohibitory side. Don't we normally think about it as being very, very negative, very prohibitory? But she says we, may, we need to look at it from the mercy side. Its prohibitions are the sure guarantee of happiness and obedience. If we all agree that we're not going to shoot each other, are we happier? Yes. Oh. Well, yeah. If we all agree that we're not going to steal from each other, are we happier? Yes. If we all agree that we're not going to commit adultery with each other, are we happier? Yes. Yeah. As received in Christ, it works in us the purity of character that will bring joy to us through eternal ages. To the obedient, it is a wall of protection. If, if, if we say, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to, it's a wall of protection around us. We behold in it the goodness of God who by revealing to men the immutable principles of righteousness seeks to shield them from the evils that result from transgression. What happens when we sin? the result. Okay? We are not to regard as God. We read this last week. I'm going to read it again. We are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. We are not. Because what kind of picture of God is that? Thanks. The evil, the, 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 the fierce dictator. father, the dictator up there. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. You know, Traditional theology has us afraid of God and quietly loving sin. That's exactly backwards. We should be desperately afraid of sin and we should be loving God. My grandmother used to say, Yoli, God is not mad at you. He's mad about you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. That's great. Every act of transgression, those are sins, right, reacts upon the sinner works in him a change of character and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing, and the sure result, not the penalty, not the punishment, the sure result is ruin and death. Selected Messages, Book 1, 234, Paragraph 5 through, five, through 235, Paragraph 2. So, how should we rate to fellow Christians who want to focus on law-keeping as a way to attain perfection? That's not too hard, is it? What do we say about that? What do we say about the Pharisees among us? Not going to work, right? Is it possible to be perfect in this life? Well, once again, we need to go back to the Greek. The Greek word for perfection, the word that's translated perfection in biblical Greek, means to be mature or grown up. That's what the, what the word means. Uh, a very ripe, a delicious ripe tomato is called mature, perfect. 
um, it is possible through an ever closer relationship with Jesus Christ. But the focus must never be on law keeping and must always be on Christ. We still need the law because there will always be times when Satan will trip us up and get us to fall into sin. When we are tempted to, to do such things, we have a chance to be warned. How are we warned? By the Holy Spirit and by the law. It says, don't do that. We have a chance to be warned and to avoid those traps by remembering the guidance of the law. In the ancient Jewish tabernacle system, now here's something that's pretty significant, but something that many few people have thought about. In the ancient Jewish tabernacle system, people did what with their lambs? You brought your lamb to the gate of the tabernacle. What happened? You confessed your sins on the head of the lamb. You cut the lamb's throat. The, the priest takes some of the blood and he takes the animal and so forth and he prepares it in a special way and all this kind of stuff. But in effect, what's happening? In, in, symbol, in a symbolic way, what's happening? You are transferring your sins from you to the tabernacle, well, to the animal and then ultimately to the tabernacle, to the tent, right? And then what happens to them? Is it just a huge, one huge pile of sins? What happens? Day of Atonement comes. The Day of Atonement comes. What happens on the Day of Atonement? Through another process, you can read about it in Leviticus 16, the high priest goes through a process, other animals are chosen, etc., and a ceremony is carried out which, in which the sins are... The high priest goes in, he in, in symbolically picks up those sins and carries them out and puts them on the head of what? Goat. The scapegoat or the Azazel goat. And what happens to that goat? Send him so out. It's taken far, far away from the camp. We can never find its way back again. It probably gets eaten by a lion or something. So that's a symbolic way of saying what? Ready to sin again. <laughs> no. Separate, separation. It, it's God's way of saying, I want to separate you from your sins. Not to be separated from God, but he wants us to be separated from sin. Was that something that God asked them to do, or the people did it just to relieve themselves and start all over again till next year? You mean the sanctuary system? No, God, God had to choose something that was semi-familiar to them. You know, he, did, he didn't say, buy yourself a three-peat suit, mm -hmm. sit down in church, and let me preach you a sermon. That was something they weren't familiar with. So God picked out something that they were somewhat familiar with, and he says, through this process, I want you to understand that I'm trying to help you separate from your sins. Okay? Anyway, okay. Once again, remember Romans 14, 23. It tells us that the closer we come to God... The further we are from sin, sin and vice versa. The, far, the closer we are to sin, the further we are from God. While Jesus offers to forgive our sins, that was never intended to be an excuse to go out and do them again. Every time we sin, it scars us. Wouldn't it be better to turn to Jesus asking for his health, healing touch and giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work in our lives to take us out of this sin, death, Spiral. So let's review this again. The, the sanctuary service teaches us that, and, and it's important to notice several things. First of all, what's the very first piece of furniture when you walk in the front gate of the tabernacle? The altar of burned off incense. Uh, not, not incense, uh, altar of burned offering. And what, what symbolically happens at the altar of burned offering? That's where yeah. your sins are taken away from you. They are, they are take, and, and the sacrifice is put on the altar and so forth. So the first thing that God offers you when you come to him is what? Forgiveness. 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 He says, I'm not going to treat you as a sinner any longer. I'm offering you forgiveness. And then goes, the, goes on with the rest of that process. God takes it back. The, the sins are taken into the tabernacle. Once a year, the, holy, the, the high priest goes into that most holy place. And what's in the most holy place? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. What's inside the Ark? 
Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, yes. Okay, what's on the top of the ark? The lid. The lid. That lid is called the kipper in, in, in Greek. I mean, I'm sorry, in Hebrew. So the, the day of the lid is Yom Kippur. Okay, the day of the lid. And above that lid is what? Angels. The Shekinah glory of God hovers over that, right? So between the broken law and the Shekinah presence of God is the, the lid, the mercy, what we sometimes call the mercy seat. That mercy seat idea was invented by Martin Luther. That was never in the original translation, the original ideas at all. He just made that up. Referring it to as a place of reconciliation, isn't that what... Uh, yep. Uh, a place or means of reconciliation, yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So if the people understood that, if we understood that today, what would it mean in terms of our modern lives? We come to God, and what's the first thing that happens? Forgives us. He forgives us. Our sins are taken away. But there's still a law to deal with. There's still God's presence to deal with. What happens? The sins are taken in there symbolically. And the whole, when the high priest goes in there, he picks those sins up, he takes them out, he puts them on the head of the scapegoat. And it's taken far away. Now, in modern terms, what does that mean? God is saying, if you draw closer to me, I can, I can cleanse your life, I can purify your life, I can purify your motives, I can do all those things for you. If you choose to continue to go on sinning, what happens? Let you go. He lets it. Ultimately, you have to do what happens, what it says in Hosea 4, 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Let him go. Leave him alone. And that's not what God wants to do. God wants to be our friend. He wants us to think of him as our friend. He wants us to, to see the advantages of living a life like Jesus Christ so we don't have to die the death that Jesus died. So the choice is placed before you, just as it is before us in this lesson. Which, which, which do you want? Do you want to live eternally? Do you want to live a life like the life of Jesus? Or do you want to die the death which he died? The choice is yours.